We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the first session of a webinar series, which is a collaboration between the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America and the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. My name is Mike Heffernan. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon practicing in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is in the United States, and a member of POSNA. I'm joined by my co-director, Dr. Sandeep Padwarden, who's a professor of orthopedic surgery and the secretary of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. Our hope is that through this collaborative, we'll present a series of educational sessions that we can all learn from. The agenda for today uh, we'll start with brief remarks from the presidents of both societies. We'll then move into the first educational session, which focuses on femoral shaft fractures. And three talks will be given by members of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, and that'll be followed by a time of questions. The next session will focus on femoral neck fractures, and that will be given by the Posey faculty. And we will wrap up with a case discussion with four cases presented to our panel of po POSNA and POSI uh, faculty to discuss. Our hope is that this will be interactive. For those of you who are on Zoom, please type your questions into the chat. And for everyone else who is tuning in via YouTube or live stream on Ortho TV, uh, we have two routes for questions. The first is to text Dr. Pat Warden using WhatsApp. And here's the phone number. You may want to take a screenshot of this. And the second, I will be manning an email that we created for the webinar series, and that's posna.posey at gmail.com. We hope that everyone finds this very educational. And with that said, I'll turn it over to the presidents of each society. Thank you. Um, this is Min Kocher. And, um, Good morning and good evening. Um, on behalf of <clears throat> POSNA, I wanted to congratulate um, the POSI and POSNA organizers and speakers for this webinar. Um, I think po POSNA as uh, with POSI has had challenges during COVID. We've had challenges in terms of canceling meetings, um, financial stability of our organization, organizations and staying connected and, and staying of value to our members. Um, one of the positive lessons that we've learned um, is the value of virtual education. Um, and I think uh, before this started, we were talking about um, Posey's efforts and incredible uh, uh, efforts in virtual education with webinars um, such as these um, that are, li that are uh, live on Zoom, but then also live stream to a very broad audience um, via Ortho TV and YouTube. Um, I think the relationship between POSNA and POSI is an important one. Um, it's really a source of valuable exchange of ideas uh, and personal friendships. Um, I will uh, would invite everyone um, personally um, to join us at the POSNA annual meeting uh, in Vancouver in May uh, 2022. Um, it should be a great meeting, uh, and we will um, have a virtual component to that meeting as well. Um, I just wanted to close on a personal note. As an Indian American, um, my relationship to um, Posey has been very meaningful to me personally. Um, I think reconnecting um, with India and developing strong personal and professional friendships uh, has been um, a, a real uh, a meaningful um, opportunity for me. So thank you very much um, for this collaboration between POSNA, POSI, and for attending this webinar. Uh, can I invite Dr. Dhiren Ganjwala, president of POSI, to make his opening remarks? Sir, uh, new please. Good evening and warm welcome to the leaders of POSNA and POSI, the faculty from POSNA and POSI, and all the viewers across the globe. It's a wonderful event, and we are really lucky to have this combined webinar meeting of POSNA and POSI. It's a great moment for all of us as we are moving ahead 
to develop a strong relationship between two large society which are working for the benefits of children with orthopedic problems. And I'm sure that this and the future endeavors will enrich the knowledge of our members, which in turn benefit the children not only from the two continents, but children from all over the world. I should also like to emphasize that the POSI is a partner to create content and to provide faculty. The vast experience of our colleagues which will definitely help surgeons practicing in many countries where resources are not that great and the situations are similar to India. I appreciate the hard work done by Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan to make this happen and also the efforts of OrthoTV to telecast this webinar world over. And with that, I wish a good luck to this series. Thank you. Over to you, Sandeep. Bye. Can you kick off the first session? Okay, and for our first session, we are focused on femoral shaft fractures. The first speaker will be J. Eric Gordon. He'll be discussing spica casting versus flexible nails in young children. Um, Dr. Gordon is a professor in the Division of Orthopedic Surgery at the Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Gordon? Sorry, I got to unmute myself here. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak here. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about femur fractures in young children and different options that we have. This is a very common uh, sort of injury that we all treat. This is an 18-month-old male who fell while playing. He had a twisting injury to his left lower extremity. Radiographs reveal a spiral uh, femur fracture. And the question is, what kind of definitive treatment should we address with this child? Uh, this child in our hands was taken to the operating room. He was placed into a uh, spica cast. Uh, the hip was uh, in 90 degrees of flexion and the knee was in 90 degrees of flexion to allow just the distal fragment to align with the proximal fragment. The hips were abducted about 45 degrees and had adequate alignment in there. Um, when I'm applying these spica casts, I usually position the kids on the table with the hips flexed 90 degrees, the hips abducted 45 degrees, and the knees flexed 90 degrees, which is pretty much a typical traditional spica cast. We try to get a quadrilateral mold on the thigh, and we can extend the cast distally to the ankle on the affected side, and we typically leave the contralateral leg free below the knee. Um, we don't apply a long leg cast first, as this has been shown to be effect, uh, associated with uh, the development of Volkmann's ischemic contracture and compartment syndromes after these femur fractures. So we apply the cast from proximal to distal. This is something that we all do almost every day. Uh, Jack Flynn has uh, reported uh, about <clears throat> 10 years ago the results of using a single leg spica or walking spica for these patients. They had reported the results of a prospective study of 45 patients with a uh, single leg spica. 19 of them had the single leg spica and 26 had a uh, traditional spica. They had equivalent healing. Wedges were, wedging of the cast was required more often in the single leg spica and uh, occasionally in the traditional spica. And a couple of the traditional spica casts were returned to the operating room for loss of production. They found that there was a significantly decreased impact on the family in the single leg spica group, which brings up the question of what kind of impact on the family does placing kids in a spica cast have? Our patient uh, returned about a week after the uh, uh, fracture was reduced in a spica cast, was doing well at that point. Uh, the cast was removed at four weeks. There was good healing. This is two months after uh, the fracture. The patient was walking, had a little bit of an out-toed gait and a limp, but doing well. 
And here he is six months after his fracture. He's doing very well. His gait is relatively normal. Uh, motion is normal. Radiographs reveal complete fractural healing. And here he is a year out from his injury with equal leg lengths and early remodeling of the fracture and is done extremely well. The problem is spica casts also have drawbacks. We've all seen these sorts of uh, cast sores that in children that we've placed into spica casts. Spica casts, on the other hand, are also difficult for the, the child. They're difficult for the family to care for. Uh, at least in, the, in North America, we have a lot of uh, single parent uh, families, and these become very difficult questions in terms of child care and other issues. In addition, often spica casts are not appropriate for high energy trauma patients, which are unusual but do happen in younger age groups. Uh, as an example, this is a five plus nine year old male who was involved in a motor vehicle versus pedestrian accident. The left side is open with a seven millimeter traumatic wound and his uh, both lower extremities were neurovascularly intact. He was, this is really not appropriate for a spike of cast and this, this sort of an injury gave us the first experience that we had with uh, operative care of Nancy nailing of these fractures. Um, that led us to a review a series. It was a multi-center series with Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and St. Louis, where we reviewed 215 patients with spica casts. The higher energy injuries tended to be nailed in that group. And the, uh, we treated 141 of these fractures with spica casts and 74 with Nancy Nails. Um, there was equivalent time to union and shorter time to ambulation and activities in the group that had the uh, flexible nails. So we found this to be a safe and effective treatment. This patient was taken to the operating room. You can see even as a length and stable fracture on the right side was flexibly nailed. The left side was flexibly nailed as well. Here he is six weeks out from his injury. He's allowed weight bearing is tolerated. PT was started to help him get up in his feet. And here he is two years later, he has equal leg lengths, he is well aligned and solidly healed and has done extremely well. With this, this experience in patients who have, flex, uh, have been flexibly nailed, that led us to ask whether or not this was a good idea. For the most part, spike casting is well tolerated, the fractures heal well, gait issues usually disappear within six months. The problem is these are difficult. They, we run into cast sores and other complications. One of my partners says that a spiky cast is a tool of the devil, and I'm not sure that's completely true. But the question comes up, why do we want to inflict this on kids? Um, is it because they don't complain? I, don't we care? Nobody really likes a spiky cast. Um, that led us to look at a prospective study in St. Louis of 75 patients. Uh, this was such with 39 of these patients were treated in a spica cast and 36 were treated with flexible nails. The treatment path was decided by the uh, family and the surgeon looking at the fracture, looking at the child and deciding what would be best for the family. These patients had equivalent healing. They were, there was a significantly decreased impact on the family and the nailing group looking at the social and economic impact of the, on the family. And we concluded that we should talk to the families before we proceed with a treatment plan on these kids with spike with uh, femur fractures. Uh, this is a two-year-old female who fell, was unable to walk, had pain, has this very similar looking spiral fracture to the original fracture we saw. In conjunction with the family, it was decided to uh, proceed to the operating room and had uh, flexible titanium nails placed. There was no cast. The patient was allowed weight bearing as tolerated initially. And six weeks later is solidly healed, has done very well, and is walking without problems after two weeks. This is one of the, one of the children that we have here who's about two to two and a half weeks status post Nancy nailing. You can see that the child is walking around. He definitely has a limp, um, but he's comfortable and uh, he's ambulatory and much easier for the family to transport around. He's able to be involved in daycare and other activities and is pretty happy with his result. When we look at these kids, we have to ask ourselves which one the moms uh, prefer. And I would have to say that in my practice, the moms almost universally prefer uh, flexible nails for treating these kids. 
Um, they, they're easier to take care of. There's much less of an impact on the family and uh, really do well. Um, so I think the, the conclusion of this is that early spike of casting is very effective in these kids. We rarely have high energy injuries that lead to excessive shortening. In a traditional spica, you can keep the hips and knees flexed. Usually it's about three to four weeks in a cast and you can accept up to two and a half centimeters of shortening. And there's lots of teaching to uh, help, uh, help keep the cast dry. But we have to ask ourselves, maybe we should be doing more flexible nailing. Maybe we should communicate with the families and come up with a uniform treatment plan that, that would allow us to go ahead and do what's best for the family in a situation like this. Um, I definitely don't wanna say that all of these children should be flexibly nailed. I use a lot of spiky casts in my practice, but on the other hand, I think it's a, a viable option and something we all ought to be thinking about. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Much appreciated. Next up, we have Dr. Ying Li, who's going to be presenting school-aged children, um, flexible nails versus submuscular plate. Dr. Li is an associate professor and chief of the section of pediatric orthopedic surgery at the University of Michigan, where she's also the program director for the pediatric orthopedic surgery fellowship. Yang. Thank you very Thank you very much, Mike, uh, and thank you to both organizations for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Well, I'm trying to advance my slides. Here we go. Here are my disclosures. So we'll start off with a couple of cases. So case number one is a 10-year-old male who was involved in a football tackle. He sustained a closed proximal third transverse fracture, and he weighed 41 kilograms. The second case is a seven-year-old male who fell while jumping on a trampoline. He experienced a closed proximal third long oblique fracture and he weighed 31 kilograms. Here's a summary of the AOS clinical practice guidelines. And they state that it is an option for physicians to use flexible intramedullary nailing to treat children five to 11 years of age with diaphyseal femoral fractures. And some muscular plating and flexible intramedullary nailing are treatment options for children 11 years to skeletal maturity with di diaphyseal femoral fractures. But I would submit that the treatment for these fractures shouldn't only be based on age, but also weight and fracture stability. So for children aged 5 to 11 years who weigh less than 49 kilograms, length stable fractures can be treated with flexible intramedullary nailing, and length unstable fractures can be treated with some muscular plating. For children aged 5 to 11 years who weigh greater than 49 kilograms, some muscular plating is an option. So starting off with flexible intramedullary nailing, this is the most popular technique for management of femoral shaft fractures in children aged 5 to 11 years. In the United States, titanium elastic nails are most commonly used, but stainless steel nails can also be used. And compared to external fixation, flexible intramedullary nailing has been associated with a lower malunion rate, refracture rate, adverse events, time to full weight bearing, time to regain full joint range of motion, and time to return to school and activities. Indications for flexible intramedullary nailing are fractures in the middle 60% of the femoral shaft, children aged five to 11 years who weigh less than 49 kilograms, and length stable fractures. Most people are probably familiar with this multicenter study that looked at 230 femoral shaft fractures treated with titanium elastic nails. The authors found a significant relationship between age and weight and outcome. Children age 11 years and older had a nearly four time uh, likelihood of a poor outcome and children who weigh greater than 49 kilograms were five times more likely to experience a poor outcome. This paper compared uh, complications based on fracture type. Transverse and short oblique fractures were considered length stable and long oblique spiral and comminuted fractures were considered length unstable. These authors looked at 39 femoral shaft fractures and they found that shortening or angulation was more common in the unstable fracture group. In addition, linked unstable fractures were more likely to require unplanned surgery and all of these surgeries involve shortening or removal of prominent or exposed nails. So here is a five-year-old female with a spiral femoral shaft fracture that was treated at an outside institution with titanium elastic nails. She was transferred to our emergency room at two weeks post-op for exposed hardware. You can see here that the tip of the lateral nail is exposed. And while we do not have any uh, post-injury uh, post and uh, post-op films after her first surgery, 
you can appreciate that this fracture likely shortened resulting in prominence of that nail. When determining nail size, the nail should be about 40% of the narrowest femoral canal di diameter. Another simple formula to use is to take the narrowest femoral canal di diameter and subtract one and divide by two. So in this x-ray, this individual has an eight millimeter canal diameter. So eight minus one divided by two would be 3.5 millimeters. So that would be your nail diameter. You always want to insert two nails of equal diameter. I place the patient supine on a radiolucent table, use fluoroscopy to locate the nail insertion site. I usually place the lateral nail first, so make an incision on the lateral aspect of the thigh, extending two centimeters distal to the proposed nail insertion site. Dissect through the subcutaneous tissues and iliotibial band. You can open the lateral cortex of the metaphysis with either a sharp awl or drill. I prefer the awl because then you don't have to open a power drill and there's decreased thermal energy production near the physis. Next, you redirect the all or the drill cephala to make a 10 degree angle with the lateral cortex. Place a slight bend at the tip of the nail to facilitate advancement and assist with fracture reduction. After you insert the nail in the starting hole, verify the position with fluoroscopy. Then reduce the fracture and advance the nail across the fracture site. If you're having trouble passing the lateral nail, you can now insert your medial nail and you may be able to pass that nail across the fracture. Alternatively, once the tips of both nails are at the fracture site, you can use the nails to manipulate the distal fracture fragment to reduce the fracture and pass your nails. The final position of the lateral tip of the nail should be just distal to the greater trochanteric apophysis, and the tip of the medial nail should be at the same level, but pointing toward the calcar region of the femoral neck. This figure on the right here shows the relative fixation points of retrograde nails in the femur. So trim the nails when they're one centimeter from the, their final position, impact the nails with a tamp, and do not bend the nail tip away from the cortex as this will lead to soft tissue irritation. Postoperatively, you can consider using a knee mobilizer to decrease soft tissue irritation. I usually discontinue the knee mobilizer and have patients start knee range of motion at two weeks. I keep patients touched down weight bearing for six weeks and the nails are removed after clinical and radiographic union. So moving on to some muscular plating, this is my preferred technique for the management of length unstable fractures in children aged five to 11 years. As we saw earlier, the outcomes of titanium elastic nail fixation of these fractures are suboptimal. Now traditional open compression plating is an option. Advantages of this technique are it restores length and alignment and provides excellent stability. Disadvantages are extensive soft tissue stripping at the fracture site, leading to concern for delayed union or non-union, greater blood loss, higher infection rate, and pain and scarring. So the basic con or so the indications for some muscular plating are length unstable femoral shaft fractures, fractures in the subtrochanteric and supracondylar regions, children aged five to eleven years who weigh more than 49 kilograms and children older than 11 years with a femoral canal that is too narrow for rigid intramedullary nailing. So this study looked at 27 unstable femoral shaft fractures treated with some muscular plating, and the authors reported no intraoperative or postoperative complications, no instrumentation of failure or loss of reduction, and bony union by 12 weeks in all patients. Some of the same authors from that prior paper then did a retrospective study comparing two cohorts of femur fractures, the first period was when titanium elastic nails were used pretty much for all fracture types. And the second period was when the authors had transitioned to fixing unstable fractures with some muscular plating. And when the two periods were compared, there was a decrease in all complications, major complications and complications associated with titanium elastic nails. And when an analysis was based on fracture type, they also found a decrease in complications for both stable and unstable fractures. So the basic concepts of some muscular plating are a longer plate with fewer screws, indirect fracture reduction, stable fixation with improved biomechanics and maximum biologic healing. So the implants acts like an internal external fixator. Long plates have an increased working length resulting in decreased strain on the construct and less pull up force on the screws. X-fix principles apply, so you only need one screw just proximal and distal to the fracture, and the remaining screws are placed far apart for maximum construct stability. And the minimally invasive insertion technique avoids soft tissue disruption around the fracture site, promoting rapid healing. 
You can use either a small, use a small frag or a large frag narrow stainless steel LCDC plate. Uh, I prefer a straight plate, but there are thermal locking plates with an anterior bow that are commercially available. The patient can, is placed supine on either a radiolucent table or fracture table. The fracture is provisionally reduced using inline traction. Use fluoro to determine the length of the plate and use a plate bender to contour the plate to match the proximal and distal metaphyseal flares. Next, make a small lateral incision over the distal metaphysis. Open up the IT band and elevate the vastus lateralis anteriorly. Use a Cobb elevator to make an extra periosteal tunnel for the plate deep to the vastus lateralis, and then insert the plate and advance it proximally under floral guidance while holding the extremity in traction to maintain your fracture length. Once you've confirmed the plate position and reestablishment of fracture length of fluoro, insert K wires proximally and distally through the plate for provisional fixation. And then you can place your first screw through the open incision and all the other screws are inserted percutaneously. So a couple of tips and tricks. The second screw can be used to achieve indirect fracture reduction by placing it through the plate just proximal or distal to the fracture fragment that is farthest from the plate. You can check the length of your percutaneous screws by placing the depth gauge over the thigh and checking it with fluoro rather than trying to insert the depth gauge through the small percutaneous incision. Tying a Vicro suture over the screw head helps prevent the screw from disengaging from the screwdriver during insertion. And remember, X-Fix principles apply. So you only need two to three screws proximal and distal to the fracture and lag screws are not necessary. No external mobilization is necessary. I keep patients touched down weight bearing for six weeks. And it is recommended that the plate gets removed after fracture union in children with significant remaining growth. So back to our cases, this 10 year old male with a closed proximal third transverse fracture who weighed 41 kilograms was treated with titanium elastic nails and his nails were removed at six months post-op. The seven year old male with a closed proximal third long oblique fracture who weighed 31 kilograms was treated with some muscular plating and his plate was removed at six months post-op. And then this five year old who was treated with titanium elastic nails who had an exposed nail tip her nails were removed. She was revised to a submuscular plate and the plate was removed at nine months post-op. So in conclusion, indications for flexible intramedullary nailing or fractures in the middle 60% of the femoral shaft in children aged five to 11 years who weigh less than 49 kilograms with length stable fractures and indications for submuscular plating or length unstable femoral shaft fractures, fractures in the subtrochanteric and supracondylar regions children aged five to 11 years who weigh greater than 49 kilograms and children older than 11 years with a femoral canal that is too narrow for rigid intramedullary nailing. Thank you. Thank you, Ying, appreciate that. And our next speaker is Keith Baldwin. He is an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania and director of orthopedic trauma at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. He'll be talking to us about treatment options in early adolescence for femur fracture. All right, I uh, hope everybody can hear me. I'd like to thank uh, Michael, Pazna, and Posey for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk uh, today. So I'm gonna be talking about how to treat adolescents and pre-adolescents with femur fractures. Uh, Sorry, I have no specific disclosures uh, financially, but my uh, personal disclosure is that I love to nail femur fractures. It's one of my favorite cases in peds ortho. Um, so the problem for, uh, for deciding what to do uh, with these, these sort of adolescents and pre-adolescents um, is uh, we have guidelines to treat femur fractures, but there were very few, uh, very few recommendations that were considered to be good evidence. Um, and the, uh, the, the meme is kind of that kids do well with a variety of treatments. Um, and data are limited by numbers that are too small to detect um, the small differences and complications that exist between children. Uh, data are mixed and it's hard to tell why sometimes. Um, children are different uh, from adults in some key ways. Uh, you know, our pediatricians say children are not just small adults and Dr. Seuss says things like uh, adults are just obsolete children. Um, but one way or the other, they're different from adults uh, in some key ways. Uh, and there's lots of lots of ways to skin a cat. Um, the older an adolescent gets, the the closer treatment gets to uh, adult treatment. So what are we supposed to do? So when I don't I don't know what to do, I usually go to my fracture muse, who's Jack Flynn, 
Um, and he actually came up with a philosophy um, and it was based on a lot of the things Dr. Lee talked about. Um, so, you know, the age of the child, if the fracture is stable, how heavy the child is. Um, and I would encourage you uh, to read this article um, on um, the sort of principle-based treatment of diaphyseal pe pediatric femur fractures. Um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty um, in-depth concept, uh, but it's a good article. Uh, so basically you wanna start with what we have. So the pros of treating pediatric femur fractures is that we have a, uh, you know, sort of a big happy bone, lots of soft tissue, great blood supply, uh, and basically a healthy host that will heal if you don't get in their way. Um, the cons that we have to um, sort of overcome is that uh, implants are generally for adults um, or at best they're second generation uh, implants. Um, so there's some pitfalls with the proximal femoral blood supply uh, and growth plates are there, which we can get in the way of our metal. Uh, so the goals of surgery basically is that we want to restore function as quickly as possible. Uh, can we let them walk on it is a, is a key question a lot of times. We want to decrease the surgical invasiveness, both intraop and into the patient's life, uh, minimize complication and minimize hardware failure and drama. Some of the complications we like to avoid are uh, avascular necrosis, growth disturbance, hardware failure, non-union, malunion, infection, and loss of function. Uh, in terms of AVN, this, this one sort of gets beaten to death in terms of uh, femur fractures. Lots of the new nail designs sort of avoid these. Uh, but effectively, the, the, the blood flow to the proximal femoral um, epiphysis changes throughout uh, childhood um, to where first there's no ossific nucleus and you have good blood flow. Then you get a physis, which basically blocks part of the blood flow. And then you get maturity, um, which you have a little bit of restoration of that blood flow. Uh, and it's why some, some implants are sort of acceptable in adults that aren't acceptable in children. Uh, and so this is why the academy said that, you know, sort of uh, piriformis nails are not an option. They go through this red zone, which sort of uh, goes right through where the blood supply comes in. Uh, and so if you, if you, you know, sort of bag that blood supply, you're, you're looking at potential AVN there. Um, troke entry nails are a little bit further off of the uh, greater troke and lateral entry nails are seven to 10 degrees off. So they're, they're even further off. So, uh, so next you want to sort of avoid growth disturbance, right? So if you're going to do a femoral nail on a children that, uh, children that are uh, sort of younger than eight, uh, you worry about this sort of theoretical risk of cox of valga. It hasn't been seen clinically, but we, but we do get concerned about it. Um, and a lot of times our nails are not, uh, you know, sort of small enough to fit uh, in, in those children anyway. Um, lateral entry nailing tends to do well and gets no uh, ABN. Interestingly, I saw an animal model uh, this, this year at the, um, at the academy that even suggested that you could do retrograde nailing, although I don't know anybody that's doing that yet in children. So the next thing we want to do uh, when we're considering what we want to use to fix a, uh, a, a femur in an uh, adolescent or pre-adolescent is we want to consider hardware drama. Um, and, you know, Dr. Lee went into this a little bit, too, uh, with, with some of the drama that you can see with, um, with, uh, with flexible nailing. Uh, in terms of submuscular plating, you know, sometimes you're doing a submuscular plate, you just can't get it reduced, you have to convert to open. Uh, if you do, you might get some delayed healing from, hard, from uh, soft tissue stripping. Um, we've seen hardware failure in some, uh, some plates when the plate is a little bit too flexible. Uh, there's, there's a history of the um, uh, literature like associated with infection uh, in submuscular plating. Uh, and if the plate's too close to the physis, you can get tethering of the physis uh, and distal um, femoral valgus. External fixation is associated with delayed healing, uh, increased implant rigidity, pin site infection. Um, some patients just don't like, you know, big metal things sticking out of their leg. Uh, and you can get refracture from a disorganized callus when you have to take the, uh, the X fix off. Uh, ream nailing can be associated with fat emboli syndrome, syndrome. I put exploding femur, which is kind of a dramatic way to say that, you know, that, that nail doesn't like to make the turn uh, and you have to sort of ream up. And if you don't, uh, you can get the nail stuck. Uh, malrotation is a very, very common thing associated with nailing that you have to check before you leave the operating room. Non-union or malunion is very, very rare, fortunately. Uh, this is a case where we had a, a, a lesion, um, you know, an NOF, uh, and we put a plate and the plate bent. Um, so it's one thing to kind of be aware of. You have to follow these kids closely if they have plates. Um, I would say it's often an issue with the thickness of a four or five plate. Uh, which refers to the implant that you, the the screws that you can put through it, not necessarily the thickness of the plate. Uh, we've revised these in the past. Um, I've even known people that have bent the plate back and casted it. Uh, you know, re ream nails. I've, I've you know I see very few issues with them other than fat emboli, uh, and I've only seen delayed union with external fixation. Uh, infection rate is still pretty low. It's more more common with a submuscular plate than it is with other things. Uh, pin sites infections are pretty common. Um, and some data uh, out of Baltimore suggests if you're going to convert 
uh, an X fix to a nail, you should do it in less than 14 days. Loss of function in kids is, is fortunately extremely ro uh, rare, uh, but malrotation is a potential issue. Uh, in damage control situations, function loss is more a result of traumatic brain injury and less from medical issues. And it's important to keep in mind because um, there's data su that suggests that, um, you know, that third peak of death that happens in trauma happens extremely rarely in children. And so damage control should be used sparingly. Uh, so in terms of my preferred technique uh, for, for this age group, I prefer uh, ream nailing because it's simple, it's versatile, it uh, works in a variety of situations. Uh, most often you can walk them on it and it has a low complication rate. Uh, you you want to do it in length unstable fractures or uh, you can do it in kids that are greater than 45 kilograms and older than 10 is, is my indication, but I know people that do it in under eight and over eight. Uh, the advantage of, advantages of it is nails are load sharing. They're less rigid. You get bridge fixation. Uh, so you get a lot of callus and you have the potential for early weight bearing. So when you're doing this, the first thing you want to do is evaluate the patient and fracture. You want to make sure that the fracture is not pathologic. Uh, and if, if it is pathologic, you want to know what the pathology is. You can work it up either with an MRI uh, with contrast or, or, a, uh, or a biopsy intraoperatively. Um, you know, where's the question, where's the fracture anatomically? If the fracture is really distal, do you need to do a blocking screw? Is it, you know, is it close to the physis? Uh, is it subtrochanteric? Do you need to plan to open it? Uh, do you need to worry about anything else? So traumatic brain injury is probably the biggest thing. Um, in our series at CHOP, uh, the only children who uh, um, suffered fatalities were um, children that had brain injuries and they all uh, had their fatality within 48 hours. Uh, what do you want to have available? Um, I use a flat top Jackson with, with traction. Uh, foam ramp or blankets, small bump, uh, towel rolls, traction device, or an electrical conduit vendor, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, weights, a sterile rope, tra traction bow, your choice of lateral entry nail. We prefer a strong assistant, uh, so there's less work. Uh, bone hooks, clamps, F-tool, other reduction goodies, uh, and a half sheet for lateral views. We're lucky enough to have uh, something called C-Armor, but most of the time you can just use a half sheet. Uh, we usually set up the room like this. Uh, they named this thing the Jackson Traction, the Jackson Traction device, but we just went to a local hardware store and got a uh, electrical conduit bender, um, and you basically hang the traction bow, hang the um, rope off of that for your traction bow. Uh, and you know, you set up the room like this. You got your you got your bone foam. If you don't have bone foam, you can just use blankets. Uh, you want to pad the patient up very well. We use lots of, lots of foam. We use a bump under the ipsilateral hip. We got that traction pin and the distal femur. Uh, for kids, you want to put this just above the physis. You usually like to put it pretty anteriorly. Uh, if their growth plate's closed, you put it in the anterior aspect so you can slip the nail underneath the, uh, or I should say posterior to the, to the wire. Um, you want to have skillful C-arm. It's really painful if you have somebody that's operating the C-arm that is not uh, skillful with doing these. Um, you know, basically you have one guy holding traction and one guy doing the surgery. Uh, so you want to put the, uh, the guide wire, you want to get the guide wire in there and your lateral starting point. Reduce the fracture. So options to reduce the fracture is you can use a uh, traction, you can use a towel bump, uh, F tool, what I call brutam, which is just brute force, uh, clamps, temporary plates, cobs, hook, ball spike pusher, whatever you whatever you got in the room. You can use a nail to reduce it. You can use blocking screws. You can direct the guy wire, and there's lots of other ways to do it too. The concept behind a blocking screw is when you put a nail in, if it's a very distal fracture, as the uh, as a metaphyseal diaphyseal junction widens up the nail is straight and it's gonna to wanna to go straight down and it can make you end up uh, in translation or in varus. And so what you wanna do is you wanna put this blocking screw where you'd like the nail to go. So you kind of use it to direct traffic. Uh, and then you can see here what the, what a, what, what the uh, nail looks like with the blocking screw in. So sometimes we get gunshot wounds in Philadelphia. This might come as a surprise to some of you guys, uh, but basically this, this, this patient had no uh, lateral wall, uh, which is an issue if you're trying to ream because you're gonna ream out laterally. Uh, so what you can do as you put the reamer down is you can slip a recon plate, uh, or this is actually a, um, um, a uh, malleable retractor down into the, uh, the femur. Um, as you do it, you just have to make sure not to lose the, uh, the device in there as you do it. Uh, and you can also use this um, coker to push the wire immediately. So when you ream, you ream immediately. And you can see here's the result. Um, you can also have other issues like the patient on the left has a uh, has a um, an NOF you can see there, which is a, which is, a you know, can be a problem. You want to work that up if you're not sure it's an NOF. Uh, you can have a floating knee. Uh, you can have this patient here had um, spina bifida and her hip was dislocated, which can make uh, finding the um, starting point and maintaining it a little challenging. Uh, so then you want to drop the nail. 
Uh, and I would say this is the key thing with the lateral nail. So you, you, you put this in, this is a great starting point for a lateral nail. The, the tough part is the reamer, you can see how it goes. It goes really immediately. Uh, and it's, it never likes to make this turn. So what I do is I ream uh, over this, um, over the guide wire to a much, much larger size than the nail and so that it has a lot of room to make the turn. Next, you wanna judge the result. Uh, you want to use length. Uh, length, you can use bony apposition. If it's a simple fracture, you can metal ruler the contra contralateral rim. Uh, excuse me, limb. You can use a, um, uh, a preoperative true size film, which can help you know what the, the uh, size of the other limb is and, and template to that. Uh, for alignment, you can use the bobby cord test. You basically uh, hang the bobby from the center of the hip. The bobby cord should pass through the uh, medial aspect of the, um, uh, the, uh, the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle um for the knee and then go down to the center of the ankle uh, in terms of rotation you can use cortical thickness to judge it um, you can use a recon screw basically put your put your drill bit up uh the femoral neck and then just check a perfect lateral you can actually see what the what the version of the uh, femur is uh, and you can check range of motion after the nails down and they should have about two-thirds external rotation to one-third internal rotation if they have normal version uh, it's important to have a good team this is our team at shop for the most part uh, Post-operatively, transverse or short oblique fractures will typically be able to weight bear as tolerated or partial weight bearing with crutches. Uh, length unstable, um, you know, so most of the time they'll be non-weight bearing for four weeks until you see early callus. Range of motion starts immediately with heel slides, quad sets. Um, you want to wean off crutches uh, at four to eight weeks and continue range of motion exercises. Eight to 12 are gradually increasing physical therapy. Hop test and return to sports by week 12. So conclusion, conclusions are, uh, it's possible to be successful with a variety of strategies. Uh, most most uh, femur fractures do well with bridge fixation with a long working length. Um, you wanna consider possible complications, return to rapid function. And my last note is that the femur is a big and happy bone and will heal if you don't get it in its way. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. We have a few minutes for questions and <clears throat> Looking at the chat, there's a number of questions about um, some of these younger kids. I'll ask Eric to answer, but if everybody else can chime in and give their opinion, that'd be good as well. So earliest age for flexible nails. So, anybody can jump in, but go ahead, Eric. So the earliest patient I've nailed uh, with flexible nails is 17 months. Uh, that was a patient who had a femur fracture whose mother had cerebral palsy and could not hold her child in a spike of cast. Um, in a situation like that, that's kind of been my lower limit, um, you know, but uh, above that, you know, again, have a discussion with the family. Any other thoughts? I don't think I've flexed now at anybody under the age of two, but I feel like that was a unique situation where I think it was bilateral femur fractures probably similar to the example that Dr. Gordon showed. And it just made a lot more sense to treat the child with flex nails than a spike of cast. Yeah, I think, I think three the, was my bottom limit. Yeah, I think the traditional teaching was, you know, um, spike a cast to age six. And I think that's really come down. Like once you're school age, it gets very hard um, to be in a spike of cast. So maybe five and six. Um, and then I think what Eric said about assessing the family. I think, um, you know, for some families, putting a kid in a spike of cast is like the worst thing you could do to the family and the family really just kind of blows up. Other families, it's no big deal. The kid's bulletproof in the cast and, and goes everywhere. And, and it's, it's a little bit hard to figure those out, but sometimes it's not so hard to figure that out. I don't know what your thoughts are, Eric. Yeah, so Min, just a comment here. Sorry. Uh, do you think the social structure of a country has any bearing on this with joint families, the economics of surgery versus a uh, spike a cast and taking absolutely. care of the child with more people at home? I, absolutely. I think it's it's almost like taking care of an elderly parent. The more the, the bigger the family structure, the easier it is. I think when you have a single uh, parent family, which is often a single mom that's working, and now the kid can't go to childcare or kindergarten because they're in a spike of cast. That's, it's, that's like a catastrophe for the family if there are no support systems around. Whereas if you have an extended family, um, it's, it's quite different. 
And I think that plays into the conversation with the family. And I'd be curious to see what other people say, but, you know, single parent families, but also now uh, in the U S there's a lot of dual working parents. So if both parents are working and we just put out a study that showed around 15% of daycares would be willing to take a patient back um, with a spike of cast. So, you know, trying to figure out some of that um, social issues surrounding this femur fracture, what are the conversations that some of you have with a family to decide one way or the other? Now, the, the uh, idea of having uh, daycares that won't take, take kids and spike a cast was actually <clears throat> what drove us initially to nailing some of these younger kids. And uh, because we had families that told us that mom would have to quit work in order to take care of the child in a spike of cast. And Sandeep, so in your, in your context, what I'm hearing is that it's different because there's yes. more people available to take care of the child. Yes, there are two things I think which are socially relevant in our country is that India is a, a first world population which like you said, is a single working mom or both parents working and children going to daycare and who would prefer the intervention. And then there is a large group which is economically challenged and under no circumstance wants a very expensive surgery and cannot afford a complication or a second surgery of implant removal, hardware removal again, when you put in a nail or a plate. And we know that uh, Spica or even Thomas' splint works pretty well. So we, we have a blend of both cultures happening simultaneously. And uh, I, I think uh, Dhiran Bhai and Taral can also weigh in as to how we need to tackle these children, very young kids, because uh, the message, at least to the Indian public, uh, the orthopedic surgeons in the third world cannot be that you are okay to nail a 17-month-old kid. The situation socially and economically is totally different. So, Sandeep, can I say something? Yeah. Is my sound heard here? Yeah. We can't hear you, Taral. Taral, we can't hear you. You know, I tell him. Taral, probably you can switch off your video so that be better some experience during covid times during the yeah yeah during covid time when there was a lockdown you know the hospitals had a big burden of managing covid uh, patients and we really didn't have ot available and there were beds not available to admit a patient give attention that and you, if you can't then i'll just let it go i'll, I'll type my comments on on the chat box Okay, Terrell, it sounds like we're having a little bit of difficulty and you're going to put the comments in the chat box. Um, switching things up, in terms of submuscular plate, uh, Yang, when it goes in minimally invasive, when you take them out at six months, um, do you need to make a bigger incision or and how do you avoid that um, you know, so that it stays with uh, small incisions? I think that in most cases, it is necessary to extend the incision. So if you insert the plate distally, that distal incision will need to be extended. Um, and if it's more proximal fracture and you insert the plate from proximal to distal, um, that incision needs to be extended. And I tell the families, you know, and, uh, you know, we, I tell them we may look really slick and have this teeny tiny incision, we insert the plate, but realistically, there will probably be some bony overgrowth. Um, by the time we take the plate um, out and we will need to extend it. And, and this is for anyone. There's a question um, from Terrell actually. How common is distal valgus after femoral plating? And if the child's a little bit older and doesn't have that much growth left um, for growth modulation, how do you manage that? So I don't, I don't have an exact percentage off the top of my head, um, but I would say that the closer the plate is to the distal physis, the higher the likelihood that you are going to um, have a valgus deformity. 
So I think you do really need to be careful about the uh, uh, distal aspects of your plate not being too close to the physis. I guess I'll let Keith at, uh, answer that second question since he talked about adolescence. Yeah, so there are a couple of questions to me for, on the WhatsApp. Uh, people are asking, how early do you allow weight bearing after flex nails and do you use titanium flex nails? So I usually keep kids touch down weight bearing for six weeks, but realistically in that patient population, like if it's a six year old, they're not going to understand touch down weight bearing. So I just keep them non weight bearing for six weeks, knowing that realistically, probably by week three or four, they're pushing the limits and starting to weight bear a little. Um, and then I prefer to use titanium elastic nails. Uh, but certainly stainless steel nails are an option. I think one concern about stainless steel nails are that, that they're a little bit more rigid. Um, and may uh, affect the, um, the bow of the femur when the fracture heals. Okay, there's a question from Nigeria. What is the Bowie cord test? I think uh, the last talk Keith. had the, yeah. yeah, Keith. Yeah, so basically you, you uh, take the Bowie cord and you stretch it, uh, and then you take an X-ray over the, the center of the hip and the center of the ankle. And then that, that bovi cord line should pass through like sort of the mechanical axis, which is usually just medial uh, on, the feet, on the knee. So like the sort of the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle type of situation. So it's like okay. to check to make sure that your alignment's appropriate. All right. right. If you have like a, a really, um, really comminuted fracture. And how early do you allow them sports after your uh, adolescent nail? Um, so, so generally, generally, um, I usually like to set things up by months. Um, so, the, you know, the, if I haven't let them weight bear on it by the, by the four weeks and I'll usually start weight bearing them on it at four weeks. Uh, and then, you know, I'll usually do, do therapy at like at eight weeks, you know, let them start weight bearing, get used to that, start doing <laughs> therapy at eight weeks. And then usually I bring them back at 12 weeks to, to check for what's called a hop test. So you basically hop forward on the uh, uninjured leg as far as you can and then hop it forward on the, the injured leg as far as you can. And if you're about 90% side to side, then you're basically clear to sport for sports in my mind. Okay. Another question for Keith, um, your traction setup on the Jackson table. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? How it attaches <laughs> to the bed and how much weight are you able to put through that? Um, I mean, we usually, you can put, I mean, you can put a fair amount of weight on them because they're, uh, you know, usually the, the adolescents, you know, have a fair amount of body weight. I mean, you obviously don't want to pull the patient off the table. Uh, I mean, I usually go like 15 pounds. We, we put it through this thin wired uh, traction um, device. Um, and then usually what will happen is, you know, I'll kind of like hold on to the traction. If I need to pull more traction, I can actually pull it through the distal femoral traction pin, um, you know, myself by manually doing traction. Um, but that, you know, that device you can do like the, the high tech one, which is the one the hospital bought, bought and likes me to use because it's like, you know, you know, fully insured and all that, but you can actually just get, like I said, you can get an electrical conduit vendor from a hardware store, machine it, and then just hook it up to the Jackson table. You just have to make sure that the, um, the holes are an appropriate distance apart. And the fact that the vector is, um, you know, to yeah. the ceiling as opposed to in line. How does that affect the sagittal plane? Oh, no, no, it doesn't. Uh, it's not to the ceiling because it hangs over the, the electrical conduit vendor. It hangs over that arc of the electrical conduit vendor. I got gotcha. you. Uh, and it's pulling straight down. So it kind of pulls in line with the femur. Okay. Um, but that that is a good point. Like, so so usually if the femur tends to want to be in, um, uh, you know, in some varus, then I'll just kind of, I'll put it on the same side. And if it's in valgus, I'll put it on the opposite side just to try to pull opposite of the, of the force, basically. Interesting right. trick. And what's okay. the advantage of that, Keith, over a fracture table? Um, I mean, if, so uh, a fracture table, I mean, you're going to get me on my soapbox, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fracture tables are kind of like, in my mind, designed for intertrope fractures like in adults. Uh, and we kind of retrofit them a little bit for, um, you know, for, uh, for femur, femoral shaft fractures. And, and, you know, you can put it on there and if you get a great reduction, you know, awesome. Uh, but if you don't, it doesn't give you a lot of freedom to kind of play with the fracture interoperatively. Um, so I think the, uh, you know, I just learned how to do them um, on a uh, Jackson table. And it's like, it kind of is life changing a little bit because you can just really manipulate the fracture a lot better. Um, and there's a lot more options of what to do uh, with it than there is if you don't get a good reduction on the fracture table. Plus, you know, everybody's had that experience with it where like Bo's posteriorly, you're trying to use a crutch from under the table and it's like really painful. 
and all that stuff. The other thing is, you know, I think in a pinch um, there, you know, Jackson tables are usually available, you know, kind of more, a little bit more widely than some of these fracture tables. The other disadvantage of fracture tables is that there's lots of different ones. Um, so, you know, you, you can kind of, they can kind of be a little bit more confusing to set up. And plus there's a well-known uh, sort of well leg phenomena that you don't see too much anymore or hear about, but it still does happen from time to time. And that's just not going to happen with a, a, a Jackson table. Um, I, I also think, you know, at first, you know, uh, people are like, well, you know, you spend a little bit more time um, sort of getting your reduction and stuff like that, uh, which I don't think I do anymore. I mean, I used to probably at first. So there is a little bit of a learning curve to it. But I think you, you uh, the, the time that you save with a fracture table from doing that, you actually waste setting it up because <laughs> it takes a lot more time to set it up. So, Mike, shall we move on to the next session? Yeah, looking at the time, yeah. we've run over yeah. just a so few there are, there are, there, transition. Yeah, so there are some questions in the chat box. I think people who are here can go through them and try to answer them uh, so that uh, those are taken care of. And uh, so thank you very much for uh, the excellent session on pediatric femoral fractures. And uh, let me invite our first speaker to start uh, his talk of, on the management of femoral neck fractures, which is Dr. Venkat Das from uh, the Ganga Hospital at Coimbatore. Can you see my screen, Sandeep? Yes. Yeah. Good morning to all uh, POSNA faculty and uh, good evening to friends and colleagues from uh, the POSI. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sandeep Patwathan for giving me this opportunity. I am delegated the responsibility of talking on tips and tricks in femoral neck fractures. And you all know that it's quite a rare fracture constituting to about less than 1% of all pediatric fractures. And it's really tricky to talk about uh, a rare fracture about the ticks and uh, tricks compared to a supragondylar fracture, something which we do at least one a week. So I've tried to put in uh, together uh, the, the principles of treatment of femoral neck fractures in children and then move on to a uh, couple of tips for reduction and fixation, which I've learned over the years, treating femoral neck fracture in children and as well as adults. Delbia classification is the common classification which is used in clinical practice. Type one is transphysal separation, type two is trans cervical fractures, and type three is basic cervical fracture, and type four is the intertrochantric fractures. And of this, type two constitutes about 50% of the fracture and is the most common. The management is pretty much straightforward and simple. You've got to get a good reduction. So it does not matter really how you're going to get, whether, whether by closed reduction or open reduction, but the point is that you aim to get a perfect anatomical reduction followed by a stable fixation. So if you are able to get a good closed reduction, the next question comes in mind is whether you go ahead and do a capsulotomy or not. So there is, though there is no strong evidence to show that capsulotomy has decreased uh, the rates of AV and including this uh, systematic review, which was done by the San Diego group in which Keith was also involved. They pulled up 935 patients and they showed that capsular decompression did not effectively decrease the AVN rates. I do personally believe that it is a small intervention and whenever you, I fix a fracture in a closed reduction, I prefer to do a needle aspiration of the joint at least to decompress the joint, which can theoretically give the benefit of decreasing the tamponade effect and decrease the chance of avascular necrosis. The next question, which is uh, which comes to my mind when we talk about femoral neck fracture, is the timing of surgery. And if you get a fracture in the middle of the night, are you going to go ahead, wheel the patient into the operating room, and fix it as an emergency, or do it the next morning? I think we have uh, enough evidence to show again that the timing of intervention does not really influence the rate of osteonecrosis. So this is a paper uh, again a systematic review published in 2018, in which they have studied about 231 fractures, and they showed that. Uh, they divided the patient to two groups, less than 24 hours and fixed more than 24 hours. And they showed that there was no significant difference in the occurrence of osteonecrosis. This is another paper from India where we do see patients who are coming in even after 10 days. This was from uh, Premier Institute in New Delhi. And they showed that none of the patients who were fixed between 24 hours and 10 days had AVN. All the patients who had, more than, uh, who had uh, AVN were fixed more than 10 days since the injury time. So I personally feel that when you get a fracture neck of femur in the middle of the night, you don't have to do it as an emergency and always can do it the next morning. Let's move on to the tips of uh, reduction. So when, I, when it comes to close reduction, I prefer to use the fracture table as much as possible. And if the child is too small for a fracture table, you can use a radiolucent table. And traction and internal rotation is the maneuver which uh, helps in reducing the most of the fractures. 
and once you reduce the fracture how to identify that you have got a good reduction these are all the following parameters which i use personally and on the ap view you look at the alignment whether the rest restoration of the neck shaft angle is good in the lateral view look the alignment between the head and the neck whether it is in a straight line and look at the borders of the neck superior and inferior in the ap view and anterior and posterior border on the lateral view once you know that all this in, uh, falls in place you've got a good reduction and you can go ahead with the fixation tips for achieving close reduction uh, i use two tricks when i am not able to get a close reduction i use intrafocal pins and shans pin assisted reduction i'm going to show couple of uh, animations to explain this so let us assume that after the close manipulation you see uh, such an alignment in the lateral view where you know that the alignment is reasonably good but there is a translation of the fracture you can use a uh, steinman pin intrafocally and then reduce the fracture and move on with fixation the same technique can be used if there is an angulation along with translation again a steinman pin and then intrafocally to reduce the fracture the pin is passed through the smith pin resonance interval and it is very safe avoiding the neurovascular bundle so this is one of a case example where we have used an intrafocal pin to achieve a reasonably good reduction in the lateral view yet another case which is uh, sandeep's actually this is a child with a, a really bad fracture so he managed to get an intrafocal uh, reduction you can see in the clinical picture that he has used a pin from the anterolateral aspect and then intrafocally has reduced the fracture and fixed it temporarily with a kyr occasionally you get fractures which are actually impacted with one another and no matter how hard you try to reduce this fracture with manipulation they won't move in these scenarios i uh, prefer to put a shans pin in the distal fragment and disimpact them and use it as a tool to rotate and fix the fracture so this is one such fracture so you can see that the fracture fragment is uh, impacted in the lateral view so we uh, try to reduce it close but it failed then we put a shans pin in the distal fragment and disimpacted it and rotated it to get a reasonable reduction so when all your tricks to reduce it close fails you have to open the fracture you have no other way out to get a good reduction traditionally we have been told that watson jones approach is a good approach for reducing and fixing the femoral fracture you can do it through the same incision but of late smith peterson approach is gaining more popularity and i came across this interesting article which was published in core in 2018 where they've done a cadaveric study to compare both the approaches and they proved that smith peterson provides a superior exposure as far as femoral neck visualization is concerned and when you do a open reduction also it could be tricky particularly when there is comminution you might have to use tools like intrafocal pins or pins in the femoral head to derotate the femoral head fragment and it can be really difficult to get a good open reduction as well moving on to the fixation so the choice of implant actually depends upon the age of the child the size of the bone and also the type of the fracture in general in the younger the child we try to use uh, smooth pins and as the child uh, the age increases we try to use cancellous screws and uh, based on the classification type 1 and type 2 fractures prefer to preferably to use pins and screws but as you move down type 3 and type 4 fractures it is preferable to use devices with a side plate like a pediatric dhs or a, the pediatric uh, locking hip plate so this is the age based treatment recommendation which was published in jos in 20, 2009 and as you can see that in the intermittent age group from 4 to 10 years irrespective of the method of fixation they have recommended it is better to add an additional hip spica supplementation for immobilization and as i told as you move down to type 3 and type 4 fractures it is preferable to use constructs which has a side plate to prevent collapse so when you plan the fixation after achieving the reduction it is preferable to hold the reduction with the k wire so that the head fragment does not rotate when you put the screws and you should the threads of the screw should always cross the fracture site so that you get adequate compression and if you don't have enough purchase in the head it is do not hesitate to cross the physis after all stability is more important than preserving the growth and non union is more problematic than shortening and premature physal closure is usually not a problem so this is a case of a 10 year old uh, child who had a fall from height and had bilateral femoral neck fractures she was treated in this fashion she had a close reduction and the uh, cancellous screws for both the sides at 3 months she went on to heal well and at 6 months the physis uh, shut down completely and this is the x-ray at skeletal maturity and you can see that the neck is short and the trochanters are high up but clinically she is absolutely fine without any problem a tip about uh, fixing comminuted fractures so whenever you have a comminution it is preferable to uh, put the screw away from the comminution for instance in this fracture there is an inferior comminution and if you put the inferior screw first it tends to collapse into varus whereas if you put the superior screw first you can compress the fracture and then you can complete the fixation and the same rule applies good when you want to have when you have an anterior comminution 
So if you put the anterior screw in this situation, it tends to collapse in this fashion. Whereas if you put a posterior screw first, you can compress the fracture in good alignment and then complete the fixation. So I'll show this with a, with a case example. This is the same case which we saw with an impacted fracture, which we reduced with a shan spin. We got a reasonably good reduction and the reduction was held with uh, KYS initially. I hope you're able to uh, notice the minimal communication in the anterior uh, cortex here. So we placed the posterior screw and compressed. We got a good compression and then completed the fixation in this fashion. We had another case to show how things can go wrong when you're fixing these difficult fractures. This is a 10 year old child who was uh, treated with closed reduction and cancellous screw fixation. 6.5 screws were used. And as you can see, there is some amount of mal reduction, but I feel that the implant uh, could be, uh, would have been a better choice of implant, uh, could have been used in this uh, situation because the fracture looks like more of a basal fracture than a typical trans cervical fracture. So we kept this child on strict bed rest. But in spite of that, uh, it collapsed further into virus and it ended up in a virus malunion in this child, which is something which you do not want to see as a treating surgeon. So how to avoid virus collapse? There, is there any way out? And this is Sandeep Patwadhan's technique. He uses a side plate to avoid virus collapse and uh, it works reasonably well. I, I do not have an experience with this uh, technique. He uses a reconstruction plate with 4.5 uh, cancellous screws in younger children. And uh, this is another example of uh, Sandeep, again, 3.5 uh, DCP with the 4 mm cancellous screws, which again works well. And uh, in this situation, you don't have to give a spiker to the child as you're getting a stable fixation. So this is a fracture which we uh, treated recently. This is a slightly older child. It's a seven-year-old child with a basal fracture. And uh, the 4.5 screws were uh, looking really tiny. And the smallest pediatric DHS, which we had actually were crossing the physis. So, uh, we did a different kind of fixation. We used a 4.5 uh, DCP, which we have modified uh, for use in adults, which can take the 6.5 cancellous screws. So uh, we got a decent fixation with this uh, uh, construct and the child was uh, not immobilized on a spica. So this is a way out to prevent virus collapse in a basal fracture. Moving on to the newer implants, this is the femoral neck system, which is uh, the nuclear in the block, exclusively designed for treating femoral neck fractures particularly useful when you have uh, comminuted fractures in adults and young adol adolescents. So when you have a comminution, you prefer to preserve the length of the neck. This is, I, I got a chance to use this in a 25 year old uh, uh, male who had a fracture. And uh, when you do not want to compress more, more than 20 milliliter and you want to preserve the length of the neck, you can, this device just works very nice. I don't have much of an experience with this uh, femoral neck system. And I would like to uh, wind up with this uh, atypical femoral neck fracture, which we had uh, some time back. This is a seven-year-old child who was a pillion rider in a two-wheeler, which was uh, hit by a four-wheeler from the opposite side. And she had a femoral neck fracture, which had actually buttonholed into the adductors. And it was lying on the medial aspect of the thigh, actually. You could feel the femoral neck on the medial aspect. So we took her up uh, through an anterior approach. And uh, we went medial to the rect rectus. We saw that the neck was buttonholed into the uh, capsule as well as the adductors. We got it back and we got a decent reduction. The reduction wasn't that difficult as we expected. It was fixed with a 6.5 cancellous screw along with the additional K wire. And uh, we also added up a uh, 3.5 cortical screw for the trochanteric apophysis, uh, presuming to prevent uh, trochanteric overgrowth later on. So she healed well in three months of time. That's a fracture healing at three months. And at four years, luckily she was not having any avascular necrosis and she was doing pretty well. Uh, so essentially this injury was mimicking a retinocular flap technique, which we use for a modified dance procedure. We published this in uh, JBJS last year. And coincidentally, I saw her a couple of weeks back. She came to my clinic. She's got about, this is a six year follow-up of the same child after implant removal. She's doing well uh, with 1.5 centimeters of shortening and a subtle limp. And this is the way she is walking now. She's quite happy with her functions and she's not having any uh, functional limitation as such. However, I am uh, keen to do a relative neck length and lengthening looking at the X-ray, but I've just, uh, I'm keeping the child under observation as of now. Thank you for the kind attention. Thank you. Thank you Venkat for a wonderful, uh talk on how to manage various kinds of uh, fracture neck femur, especially with comminution, without comminution, side plate. So there's a lot that can be done.
and let's move on to the next problem that we commonly see in india and i'm sure even in north america you must be seeing non unions of the fraction act femur in children so over to you taral uh sandeep am i well heard uh, yes is my sound okay, okay. so let's yeah start. go ahead uh, so for non union of fracture yeah yeah a rare complication of a rare fracture and uh, sandeep and premal along with uh, sahil had uh, opportunity to publish a current concept review on on this topic in jbjs this was last year and uh, most of what i want to say today has been published uh, in this article so i uh, request everyone to refer to this article for more details so what's a non union you know for a primer it's a non union when there is no possibility of healing without further intervention so it's not a six month old fracture which will define as a non union here but if you have a fracture which has been untreated for 3 weeks it's a non union or if you have a treated fracture right at 3 months if you don't see any need then it becomes a non union in terms of numbers non union is the third most common complication of fractionic femur uh 10.8% of fractionic femur will show non union range varies from 0 to 44% depending on what literature you are reading type 2 contributes almost 65% because that's the more common fractionic femur now uh coming to factors which lead to non union there are non modifiable factors like del bit 1 and uh, will have a higher rate of non union younger the patient patient you will have more non union time of injury to presentation and thankfully from what bankert presented we can wait up to 10 days for avian to occur uh, body mass index people who are fatter pre existing pathology will give rise to more non union there are factors which are modifiable so surgeons expertise i don't know if pediatric orthopedic surgeons would have lesser non unions than general orthopedic surgeons and whether consultants will have a lesser non unions than residents when they are treating fracture neck femur it's not been studied stability of fixation and implants are very important and i hope people are listening to uh, venkat's lecture you know before deciding their choices spica in children and 10 years is very important and uh, time to surgery is also very important now when we are dealing with non unions you know this is a posi posna workshop so whether you are a posna or posi your outlook is going to be completely different here where if you are in a developed country loss of reduction and failure of fixation these are the most important causes of non union but for most of us sitting in india present and fractures which are most common causes of non union among fracture neck femur which i have seen in last 5 years 50% of the fracture neck femurs have been non unions so you know the we see a very high rate of non unions and basically this is because the fractures present delayed to us they present to us after 3 weeks to 3 years after the injury has occurred and that's the cause of non union now in the two situations your your plan of management and and uh, and is completely is going to be completely different if you have a failure of fixation if you detect it early the bone contact and bone stock these are preserved and hence the plan of management is to removal the offending implant and refix without bone graft and add a valgus osteotomy so that's the plan but if you have phrenic femur following a delayed present or following an inspection the challenges are intervening fibrous tissue and resorption of the neck and hence you need something more than valgus osteotomy so what you are going to do is do valgus osteotomy fix in situ also add a fibular stud graft to act as a additional support to fill up the areas where there is gap and also act as a biological uh, you know uh, sort of a addition to the healing process so so this is something uh, what is important biomechanically Uh, in non-union fracture neck femur, the fracture like is vertical, and what you are going to do is adduct this fracture, adduct the hip so that the fracture line becomes more horizontal, and it should be perpendicular to the vector R, so almost 15 degree to the horizontal. And after that, we are going to do a subtrochanteric osteotomy and add valgization and lateral translation. It's important to add lateral translation because this maintains the mechanical axis and also increases the neck length. so it's not just valgus you know after removing a wedge you also have to lateralize the shaft 
if you want to do a perfect bulgar's osteotomy for fraction ectema so taking you through some examples here this was a child 12 year old with fraction ectema operated infected implant removed there are cyst in the neck what are we going to do are we going to do mri to rule out a vascular necrosis the the idea here is to solve the neck still going to attempt union in these patients so we do a ct scan to identify areas of the head which are good. so you avoid the cystic areas and plan your fixation into the areas which are good and this is how you plan you adduct take a stay in adduction and plan your plans and then plan an angular uh, translation osteotomy and it's very important to plan if you're using a dhs keep your plate of the dhs little offset so that you get that lateral translation so these are some tricks which i'm going to share with you so you put uh, the implant the guide wires at 120 degrees very simple to do that you ream it and then put your dhs screw and then you put a 140 degree plate so that you get 20 degree valgus and you're going to keep this plate little offset so that you get your lateral translation and angular correction and you have converted the vertical line into a horizontal fracture line uh, and this is a follow up after 3 months in this patient who has got healing and not only he has got healing even cystic areas and avn get filled up once fracture unites it aids healing of the vascular necrosis areas and and this is what all of us have observed while treating this patient this is a 14 year old male with a vertical fracture line and a oblique fracture line fixed with multiple cancellous screws you know probably he required additional side plate which was not available in this patient so this patient treated by someone else when i saw the patient this was 3 months down the fracture line he had another fall and he was referred to us with uh, this kind of picture bent nails uh, bent screws and a non union and difficult part of the surgery was not actually doing a valgus osteotomy but was to remove the implants because the screws were bent they wouldn't come out so we had to straighten the screws one by one take them out and once the screws was removed we were ready to do the fixation he had clearly areas of bone loss and what we do is do not do open reduction give traction get the most reasonable alignments pass your guide wires so two guide wires here one for the dhs screw and the other guide wire you know to pass the fibula again you can see this is bankert's technique of manipulative reduction to get a better alignment here you know so you pass to make two tracks one for the screw other for the fibula the guide wire is put at 120 degrees you use 140 degrees plate keep the plate offset so that you get angulation as well as lateral translation and then add a fibula graft to the whole thing so that you get more stability you can fill up the gaps and you add that biological portion to this surgery and this difficult patient uh, you know in around 6 months time we had complete healing and good function and restored his length so there are still more difficult cases for example we get osteomyelitis of neck of femur and that leads to a non union a pathological fracture of neck of femur with a non union with bone loss and i'm sure these are very very difficult cases to manage the question is are you going to be able to salvage the head when neck hardly exists or you going to try something but the valgus osteotomy helps here also so this is the planning you plan an angular translational osteotomy uh, plus a fibular graft the problem here is what implant are you going to use you know uh, a pediatric proximal femoral plate is not going to work here dhs is not going to work here what you have to do is use simple implant what we did is provisional fixation took fibula percutaneously to through small incisions and then simple reconstruction plate here you know with multiple screws bent in a particular manner so you achieve the principles remain same the implants will vary you get the most stable fixation with a simple device you know aided with fibular grafts and this patient uh, over a period of 7 months you can see that difficult fracture the neck is healing the head looks good and this child uh, after 2 years she has good range of movement she able to school she can squat you know which is a very important moment uh, in our subcontinent children should be able to sit cross legged and squat and and that's the function of hip joint which people want to retain so in summary non union is the third most common complication of fracture neck femur we see it very regularly because in our country 
uh, and developing countries you know a delayed presentation of fraction neck femur a lot of fraction neck femur which gets treated in spica get healed and then they they uh, you know present to us as non unions uh, the the commonest cause of femur in a developed country like usa will be a failure of fixation or loss of reduction but in a developing country like us it will be delayed presentation most failures of fixation you know if you have a presentation you have to add a fibular graft if you want to treat these non unions and lastly i want to say is never give up you know the head may look bad the head may, head may have avian there may be pre existing uh, infection there may be bone loss you know there may be severe displacement but in in every case you can always try to salvage the head and it would work in most of the time so thank you very much again posi and posna for giving us this opportunity posna for training us through core fellowship posi for making us leaders of uh, pediatric orthopedics today for uh, india and other countries uh, and uh, thanks sandeep for giving me this opportunity thanks thank you thanks taral i'm sure there will be questions from our uh, posna colleagues about uh, this talk with the difficult problems that uh, you have shown and we'll discuss more later but let me first invite dr hitesh shah from uh, manipal kmc everybody knows hitesh and he's going to talk about the third problem that avian following fracture neck femur how to avoid and if at all how to treat uh sandeep my screen is visible yes yes very well okay thank you very much uh, sandeep for the great uh, the webinar between posi and posna good evening to all posi friends and good morning to the posna colleagues i am going to talk on the commonest problems uh, the avian following the neck femur fracture how to avoid and treat the objective of my talk is the we are going to discuss the factor influencing the avian how to avoid while treating the primary fracture of the neck femur how to diagnose following a neck femur fracture and what are the treatment modalities to treat in established avian as taral said that the non union is the third commonest but the avian is the most common and the devastating complication because ultimately we end up with a salvage surgery if it is presented little late and in literature the, the avascular necrosis following a neck femur it's alleged from the 6% to the almost half of the series and that is across the globe not only in develop or a developing country and all of us knows because the only the end artery lateral epiphyseal vessels may get injured because of the primary injury and that can be uh, the prime reason for the highest incidence of the avascular necrosis so what are the factors there are many systemic reviews from the bjj american jbgs that uh, factor influencing the avascular necrosis that may be the modifiable factor or that may be such a non dependent factor like the age of the child whether it is between 4 to 8 years or more than adolescent the severity of trauma the dulbar part displaced fracture the fracture reduction drainage of hematoma the time following a trauma late presentation or the implant selection as venkat described the types and delbert the most devastating complication the avascular necrosis as the fracture line is proximal and along with the dislocation the complication of avascular necrosis is very high in a type 1 it is also common in a type 2 as it is going distally the avascular necrosis is quite rare but very common to have with the type 1 with the almost 100% with the dislocation the fracture displacement if you see the series of the non displaced fracture and a displaced fracture the displaced fracture will have the higher frequency of the avascular necrosis even after the capsular decompression and the even though there is a conflicting results from the uh, systemic review there is the still there would be capsular hematoma tamponade effect may influence the incidence of the avascular necrosis again when we saw about the factors that if we see about the different factors the last three factors are the surgeon dependent factors with the surgeon have control for the fracture reduction the hematoma decompression and time after the trauma so 
how to avoid the avascular necrosis. If you see the child with the fractured neck femur, we should not waste time, at least in, not in middle of the night, but in early morning, we can post, cancel other list and do that as a priority. We should not compromise the quality of reduction. We must gain at least not anatomical reduction, near anatomical reduction, if it is possible. The approach is also in a surgeon dependent. We must go either with the type one and type two, either the Smith-Patterson or the beginning incision and type three and type four, we can go for the lateral the incision. The stabilization of the what Venkat described that is also very important. In the one and two, we can use the screw or the threaded wire. And the three and four, we can use a bodice tight plate because stability of the factor is also important. The implant selection is also important for the, the avascular necrosis. Whenever it's possible, we can go for the early fixation with anatomical reduction with good stabilization. And I agree with the Vankert. Whenever we do the close reduction, we should not hesitate to decompress the joint by the decompression tamponade effect because it takes a couple of minutes. And even though if we do the open reduction, it's a cardiac decompression is automatic. There are the few case examples. This is the young child presented with the type two fracture, treated with the screws with the additional spica. The two-year follow-up, the child did not have the AVN. Another child with the type two fracture, this is even a uh, nine-year-old child, we do not hesitate to put the spica and the three-year follow-up, the child did not develop the AVN. Because type one and type two have the more chances of AVN, we have taken the example of type one and type two delta type. This is a six-year-old child presented with uh, type one injury. It's a matter of the fact because we have to use the, the smooth wire to prevent the premature physal closure and put the spica. The, fortunately, the child have not developed the avascular necrosis. We are quite lucky. Coming to the next example, the, the child present, eight-year-old child went for a tracking and fall from the height and presented after the eight years following the injury. It's uh, following with the uh, 1B associated with the type one separation with the dislocation. We went for the CT scan and what we found that the femoral head was dislocated posteriorly. So there is a dilemma because if we go from the posterior approach, we may injure the vessel, but we don't have any other choice. And we went through the, there is no question of getting about the close reduction. In such cases, we went on the posterior approach and for our surprise, there was the head was lying just beneath the skin, but the, fortunately the anterior vessel, there's a flap was intact. Along with that, there was a labral tear was there, but we also repaired that. And we went on fixing with the threaded screws to get the union, but we were not worried about premature facial fusion. It went one to three months and fractured got united. We did the couple of times the scan, then the child was quite okay. The range of motion was maintained and almost uh, one year and after the implant removal, the, we were lucky to have no avascular necrosis. There was the, the sclerosis on sore seal maybe related to the labral injury. What is required in the, the prevention of the AVN, we need to immobilize the patient and do about the non-weight bearing crutch walking. The non-immobilization and the non-weight bearing or delayed walking can prevent. We can see about the range of motion and detect the avascular necrosis early if this happens in a post-operative period. How to diagnose it's a case of the avascular necrosis. Before going for diagnosis, we need to know about duration. The, in literature, the avascular necrosis would be reported from 2.3 months to almost three years. It can happen, the mean age would be seven months. So the, unless the child would be three years follow-up, we cannot say we get away without the avascular necrosis. How to diagnose the avascular necrosis? The most important, the clinical symptoms are the pain and restriction of the range of motion. The lack of development of osteoporosis or the osteosclerosis may be late. We can say about the widening of the medial joint space or the fragmentation and deformity can happen in case like a Parthi's disease. If we say about the, the suspected case of the avascular necrosis, we can do about the MRI, that may be the perfusion MRI to know about the site and severity of the 
the evascular necrosis, or if we use about the, uh, the fixation, we can do about the bone scan again. People do not recommend the bone scan, but it would be quite sensitive tool to detect that the vascular necrosis. If we do not uh, detect it only by the X-ray, it can develop about the late presentation and irreversible complication like this case. Now coming to the last point that is most difficult point, that's how to treat the established case of AVN. It the, depends on the various variables. The child may be presented with collapse, without collapse, the with fixation or a without fixation. It may be the penetrated. What I, I can say that the age of child is very important. If the near adolescent or the adult, we can do about the salvage surgery, even though if it is irreversible. The duration of the vascular necrosis is very important. Early if they present, we can do about about the salvage surgery, the site and severity, if it is quite severe, extensive involvement, again, the salvage surgery or the reconstruction surgery may not be useful. If it is a previous surgery, implant is present, if it is penetrated, we must remove the implant to prevent the collapse. The range of motion is very important to preserve the range of motion for the future surgery. If there is a collapse and the subluxes, these are the most important, very severe factor, Whatever we do, do, if it is a head is collapsed, it's very difficult to get about the normal hip joint. The weight bearing and activity of child play important role. If the child is quite active and do not follow following the AVN, the chances of poor results are very high. And if it is established non-union with avascular necrosis, the result become real complicated. I like to say that the best form of the treatment is still unknown. The result may not be better, but the, the goal of treatment to maintain the range of motion and remove the internal fixation if it is present. It is a Chinese present uh, presented last month that say that whatever you do, the hip preservation, the collapse and the hip subluxes in present, it can lead to the poor prognostic factor. This is an example, few example, nine month old, nine year old child presented following the nine months following the surgery. It was having treated with a couple of cancellous screw. We treated with the implant removal and bisposponate. The result is maintained a reasonable four year following the, our intervention. And at last follow up, the child is skeletally mature and this is having a couple of centimeter shortening, but they don't want any treatment. Another child has got the evascular necrosis with quite early the fracture united. It was treated with the non-vascular fibular graft on the lateral the surface, the weight bearing surface. And the four year following the surgery, the lateral the weight bearing part has been preserved. We can see the the child was adolescent. The medial part is still having some degree of the sclerosis, but the functional child is quite good. In summary, the blood type and displacements are the key factor for establishing the vascular necrosis. Despite the best of the best treatment, the frequency is high. We need to counsel the family whenever we see the neck femur fracture. The internal fixation with decompression might reduce the possibility of the vascular necrosis. I personally feel that delayed weight bearing we can detect early before it collapses. The early detection is desirable to prevent, can do some sort of reconstruction surgery. The hip subluxation and collapse are the bad risk factor. The best treatment of the AVN is still unknown. Thank you. Thank you, Hitesh, for that uh, lovely talk again on uh, avascular necrosis. So I think this session is now open for discussion. And uh, we welcome questions from the POSNA faculty as well as uh, people uh, across the globe. One of the questions which was asked was, does the ankle develop valgus after a fibula grafting for non-unions? Taral, uh, has, yeah. can you just answer that? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we, we take care that uh, we take less than 50% of fibula and don't uh, involve the, the lower one third of the fibula. So we have not done sort of a syndesmotic stabilization or fixation or uh, uh, you know, fusion in any of the cases. Sandeep, you would also remember that you have a paper yeah. using fibula for uh, gap non-unions and you, know, you end up taking 
you know good length of fibula and in that paper yeah. also mentions that there was no yeah. ankle instability yeah so lat- lower 16 we do not take and second I, we take it subperiosteally so most often three in three months it regenerates so there is no long term uh, problem because it just comes back and we've had really good results uh hitesh a question to you for avian uh do you think oral bisphosphonates work uh, scientifically in a avascular segment how do they penetrate and really work or do you think intra lesional uh, bisphosphonate should be used and anybody from the posna faculty can comment on what uh, is being asked yes sandeep it's a great question actually the uh, the group from the australia the lead by david little has started uh, at the clinical phase trial 3 and they used that is for the parties and all the avascular necrosis condition and they started that has already been published the trial has been registered in clinical trial registry and they have reached to the third phase they used the injectable the uh, bisphosphonate to find out the effect that has the result has not come out but i agree with you about the local injection of bisphosphonate rather than the systematic uh, bisphosphonate the reason being that if you use the systematic the bisphosphonate the avascular necrosis may not reach to the target area where we want to do about that rather than that we can do about core decompression and inject the zolenonic acid or the pomidronic acid we have used for a couple of patient and result are quite good but it's not much okay uh, um, any other yes uh, but hitesh uh, our adult colleagues have completely moved away from core decompression to oral bisphosphonates uh, in avian so which we get in uh, like 18 to 30 years of age so previously yeah. they used to do a lot of core decompressions but in the last 5 years uh they completely moved out to out of uh, core decompression to oral bisphosphonates and they say that it uh, pretty much works well in preventing collapse that's what yeah. uh, in adults it does but i'm not sure uh, why it doesn't work in children uh, any comment from the posna faculty about this particular issue of oral bisphosphonate versus intralesional for avian how do you guys manage it Um I, I don't th- I can't say I have a lot yeah. of experience with it. Um I mean I have I have heard it's uh you know with bisphosphonates it's kind of timing dependent on when you can pre- you know prevent AVN from happening. Um but I I have I haven't used it myself. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. The second one more question to Hitesh, what do you think is the role of distraction uh in uh, a collapsing head? Do you have experience of using an external fixator if you see that there is avascular necrosis happening with implant removal removing of the hardware uh, do you distract the joint to allow it to heal i am asking you because you are from the land of avian parties uh, that is manipal with benjamin's work so does, does distraction osteogenesis uh, histogen uh, work yeah uh, sandeep it's a good question reason is that the avascular necrosis following a trauma or the neck femur is different than the parthes it works very well in uh, terms of the uh, parthes disease rather than the following a trauma there are a couple of reason the parthes invariably it will go for reconstitution and the revascularization where while in case of the traumatic if it is quite severe it's that if the entire head is involved it is unlikely to come back yes but there would be role of the distraction uh, that if we put the arthrodiastasis we may gain the range of motion so i reserve okay. for the case where there is a severe restriction where there is a severe collapse we can gain the good range of motion to delay if the child presents very early the age wise it is the younger we can do the arthrodiastasis and pull through till get the regain the range of motion and that okay. that is totally different than the reconstruction total reconstruction okay so you you would use it to keep the joint distracted till healing happens to prevent further collapse and probably get some range 
and then do you think that uh, nowadays again we are in the age of safe surgical dislocation and head reduction surgery so yeah. what what do you think will be your timing of when you would do this to try to get the head some sphericity uh the, the safe surgical dislocation is there it is basically to it is there to address the fai or lateral problem or that it's basically when there is a collapse and there is the secondary problem the safe surgical dislocation I, i reserve that is only for the secondary deformity following the parthes or any other pathology not for the avascular necrosis okay venkat any comments on that after healing would you consider yeah i um, mean uh, i don't have a lot of experience with head reduction sandeep yet so but it is okay. an option definitely if you have a big head sidablum uh, uh, theoretically it is uh, definitely an option of uh, okay doing a head reduction osteotomy with uh, uh, a combined various uh, sidablum osteotomy to address the dysplasia if any so theoretically okay. it is a so, possibility so i guess address. for the audience the takeaways would be that avascular necrosis following a fracture neck femur behaves differently from parthes yes please yes. don't apply those yardsticks and principles here by doing a varus osteotomy or yeah. trying to do a head reduction because this is a different beast this behaves totally differently and it's not the same as an idiopathic avn like parthes is that is that the message that we should be giving out yeah yeah okay Uh, so I have a question. Yes. Um for Terrell with all the patients that are presenting late with non-union what's the rate of AVN that you see in those patients because from our end you know we get nervous if we wait too long to take them to the OR so I'm really curious to find out what happens you know 3 months and 3 years later. Then Are you there? Can you repeat the question? I just yeah, I lost my connection. Yeah, it's wrong. Repeat? For yeah. the patients that are presenting late with non-union, what's the rate of AVN in those patients? So surprisingly, you know, when we uh, operate those patients, we don't see much of AVN on th- those patients. I really know we have discussed this uh, in different forums. I have discussed it with Sandeep also that somehow when we treat patients late. Uh, we don't see much of avn maybe the reason is that by the time you know you intervene the the head has been already revascularized or you know through some other sources but and and we are not manipulating the fracture too much you know we are doing a close uh, there is a close opposition and we just add a valgus osteotomy so we don't see much of a vascular necrosis after surgery uh, in a child uh, uh, who has been uh, treated delayed uh sandeep or uh, yeah. Hitesh, you know would you like yeah yes yeah. yeah i would like to add that mike what we see in our country is that uh, because of local treatment by massage or whatever once the pain is gone our kids are walking around moving around with a limp and shortening so there is good vascularization or revascularization from the muscles and periosteum which is probably happening and we are not violating uh, by opening the capsule or dissecting it's it's a closed in situ stabilization and grafting with change in biomechanics that's all that is being done for the children there is no attempt to do an open reduction at all so we, as taral said a little patchy avian may be seen but functionally they do very well in fact uh, uh, venkat uh, remembers that we had done one demonstration surgery about 8 years ago in a 14 year old boy who had a nearly a 9 or 10 month old non union and the head with avian on yeah. primary x ray revascularized after surgery so there is That's always true. an attempt to heal if you provide a good environment yeah venkat you are saying something that's what uh, i wanted to add on that uh, those non union with pre existing avian also revascularizes so i haven't seen uh, any avian following a non union surgery it's the other way around yeah 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 in fact all the avians i have seen have been following fresh fracture neck femur fixation so I, i we don't suggest that you should allow them to be neglected and then fix it <laughs> to avoid avian but well, that's, yeah that's what i'm th- i'm thinking oh my goodness so <laughs> what is it about what is it about initial treatment then you know since we're here as a group do you guys have any 
thoughts as to if these delayed presentations are not having higher rates of AVN, yet we have a 50% rate of AVN, um, you know, with initial treatment potential, depending on like where it is in the neck. Um, yeah. What do you think? I mean, should this change the way we're thinking about these? No, probably I think uh, we are adding fibula on to all the patients of non-union. And as Hitesh also showed in his slides, when there is an established avian and you add a biological graft there, it helps to revascularize and there is a lot of flow from the metaphysical side into the epiphysis. That's one of the probable theoretical explanations which we can give. Yeah. Also the valgus, valgus osteotomy also. Yeah. But, but it's an interesting thought that uh, an observation that this is what is happening. And historically, if you read earlier the McMurray papers, even in adults, a simple displacement osteotomy used to work quite well. Uh, I don't know whether uh, biology has something to do with it, but it's an interesting thought. Yeah, another point I like to address that the, we do see the non-union because of the late presentation. Those kids may not go for non-union if it has been treated early. So we don't see yeah. the because of the failure of fixation. Most of the cases will be untreated or delayed presentation. Yeah, virgin. That's what so, we were saying. So that would be different than the established AVN following the fixation. So that will be the different group. Okay. So <laughs> dilemma if there are no, no fraction ecfema. We've been always taught that unless they heal, they will not get their blood, blood supply back. And here you have patients we have treated after three months, six months, one year, three years, where neck is still not healed. And we really don't know from where this blood supply is coming. So I don't know, it's, is it from the fibrous tissue, from you know surrounding capsule? You know, I think someone needs to study that and give, give a more scientific answer. Okay, so if, if there are no more questions to this session, I think Mike can, uh, we have about 15 minutes. I don't think we have too much time for a lot of cases, but we can show one case each. Mike, can you start with your case? Sure. Okay. So um, we each put two cases together. It looks like from a time standpoint, we're only going to be able to do one. Um, the case that I'll present is certainly not one that I'm showing off about. It's just one that I'm curious to find out what everybody else thinks, actually. Um, so we'll just start with that. And here's your initial presentation. The goal for this is not for me to just share. It's mostly for us to discuss. Here's an 18-month-old male, and here's your femur fracture. I'll open it to the panel. What are your initial thoughts? Unusual mechanism, Mike. What can you give us a little history? Uh, you're jumping right to it. <laughs> so this is a gunshot wound to the left thigh. <laughs> right. um, pulseless extremity. I was trying to rope somebody in to uh, have a discussion about spike casting initially, but <laughs> you got me, man. <laughs> sorry, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so pulseless extremity, superficial femoral artery injury, and a vein transection. There's a medial and a lateral wound. It was treated at our adult sister hospital um, by an orthopedic surgeon there initially. So let's say this presented to your institution. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this might be a good one for some just orthopedic damage control. You could even do a, you know, you obviously have to coordinate with your general surgeons, vascular surgeons. Um, I think the most important thing here is, you know, vascularity of the limb, reestablishing vascularity. Um, so they probably are gonna do a arterial repair or bypass grafting. So talking to them about where their incision is, what can you do to stabilize the bone that's gonna be um, not interfering with them. I think in, in older adolescents or adults, we often just do an X fix. I, I, it's a pretty young patient to do that in. Yeah, 18 months old. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think you, I think you probably could do, you probably could do an X fix. I mean, although you could also do an internal X fix as, as you know, Ying discussed, but um, you know, most of the time, you know, for that, I think the, you know, the, where they're going to want their incision and where the wounds are and, and that type of thing is going to dictate a little bit what you, 
what you come up with for your, crea- uh, you know, your creative uh, pediatric um, fixation. Um, but I think certainly X fix is on the table for this. This is one of those situations where, like I was saying before, damage control in uh, peds ortho, I think is, is not the same as it is in, um, in adult orthopedics, because in adult orthopedics, you're trying to prevent that third peak of um, deaths. Uh, but in uh, pediatrics, it's more, more likely going to be something like a vascular injury, um, you know, or some other situation with the skin or other soft tissue uh, concerns. So the yeah, predominance I, I agree of- with Keith. I agree with Keith. I think even though uh, some muscular plate it functions as an internal external fixator, A, it would require too much manipulation of the leg to put the plate on, um, which the vascular surgeons may not appreciate. And B, it would be much faster to apply a traditional X fix using just, you know, very, very small pins and bars just to stabilize the leg so that vascular can proceed with their repair. And that was, that's what was done. Um, X-Fix was placed on vascular repair with, uh, with a saphenous vein. And then once the patient was stabilized, and you can see the majority of the soft tissue and um, where vascular had done their work was medial, not lateral, although there was also a lateral wound. So one pin above, one pin below. Um, thoughts on that? I see you say the X fix was placed by adult ortho <laughs> taking you off the hook because it looks really bizarre. I was wondering if they had done that to take pressure off the vascular repair or something, but I think it's just malaligned. So, you know, you probably could come back um, and realign it with the X fix um, and maybe put in new pins or something. You obviously want to be gentle given the vascular repair. I mean, if yeah, I can I make know. a comment here, if I can no. make a comment here, uh, wouldn't you like to shorten the leg in case you're doing a vascular repair to take tension off rather than distracting it? Exactly. Yeah, I'm I trying would... to figure out, is there any bone loss? Because um, it looked like initially the fracture was a little comminuted. Is that why the gap yeah. at the fracture looks so big? They removed the it... butterfly fragment probably. Yeah, yeah if you look so, at... So I would have the... telescoped it and trunk actually compressed it to make it shorter because length won't be an issue at such age. Yeah. I mean, if they're going to do a vascular repair, you would probably want to shorten it. If it's, if they're doing a graft, you know, I would just kind of ask them what they wanted, if they wanted what their length, you know, preferences were uh, for this, because they, you know, since you, they've already got like a butterfly that you can shorten it through and telescope it through, but um, I would base it on what they want. Our, our vascular guys are pretty specific for what they want usually. Um, and, you know, I probably wouldn't do anything with the, the pins at this point, just let the vascular stuff heal in until they told me it was okay to revise it. Um, and, you know, if you needed to revise it, you could, if you didn't, if you couldn't, uh, then you could do something later if it became a problem. But I think the primary goal is this is, this is one of these cases where we, we say fracture of secondary concern and just get the leg to, you know, the vascular supply to heal in and deal with whatever you need to deal with later. Okay. Um, just to keep things moving. So I did revise it, um, not a big procedure, but we just added another pin on either side of the fracture. And you can see that with that butterfly there, it's still not distracted. In fact, I would say that it's a little bit shortened compared to the other limb. Um, but we still have this bone loss from the gunshot wound itself. Uh, how's everybody feel about this alignment? It's good. I think it's fine in that age. If it's got blood flow, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, the alignment looks good and length is about the least of your of your concerns in a kid this age. You can do something later if you need to. And has anybody done an X-Fix on kids this young? I've done. Yeah, the thing I noticed was that the the strength of the bone was pretty weak and we'll see, we'll see that come up moving forward. So what would you do post-operatively? The kid stayed in the hospital for a while, um, you know, let's say like a week or so, and then was able to go home. Um, but then represented with some issues with the skin on the medial side, ultimately ended up having four surgeries with plastic surgery and local soft tissue rearrangement to get the wounds to close. Um, this is a picture from later, but then at four weeks, this is where we're at. What do you guys, what are you guys thinking now? So 
So is is there some evidence of infection? Um, so that is a good question. And there was a debridement by plastic surgery. Um, all inflammatory markers were normal and cultures that were taken were negative. Okay. So, but, but that definitely something that we had thought about. Yeah, I mean, I might be tempted to just leave it on for longer. It doesn't look like you have like uh lucency around any of the pins or anything like that. I mean, unless the pins were like, you know, grossly pussing out, like I probably would just try to stick it stick with it a little bit longer if anything is, is this like a dynamic x fix or is it more of a um more of a just a static x fix it was static and, and are yours is uh were you ever um like around when they were like like were, when were these plastic surgeries happening like when was this x-ray taken relative to those plastic surgeries this would have been after um, at least most of those plastic surgeries and we were not around in the OR for, for those. Yeah, I was gonna say, I might be tempted to try to adjust it. So it was like, you know, <laughs> closer to get the bone was closer together. You know, if yeah, I was in there. Idea. Plastic. Yeah, but I mean, it may not work, but I might try that. Yeah, I agree so, with leaving it on. I, I think it, you know, in a, in a regular fracture, femur fracture at this age, you'd see a lot of bone at four weeks, but this is a different, um, issue with probably more soft tissue injury and devascularization, et cetera. Yeah, if you're going so, to shorten this too, you should probably have vascular around in case you kink an artery or something like that. So just to pay attention to that. That's an interesting point. Um, we, so the wounds were at that point healed. The family was going to Disney World and they were <clears throat> insisting that they did not want to go with this external fixator. Um, one or two of the pins seemed a little bit loose. I know it does, we don't really see any lucency on the, on the x-ray, but you know, we kind of convinced ourselves that they were a little bit. We discussed with the family. We agreed to change them over to a spike cast. I'm not sure why they preferred that, but uh, you know, through discussions with the family, that's what we ended up deciding. Anybody have any questions about you know, the status of the fracture? during this case. How did the leg feel when you were manipulating it? Hey, Hamdi, was it unstable? Hey. Yeah, so if we put it into varus, there was essentially a hard stop. And you know what you see on the AP is what you got. It wouldn't go any further into varus. And valgus where the bone loss was, you know, it would, I can't remember the degree. It's not like that it was completely unstable, but you know, there was certainly movement into valgus. And I wasn't too happy about this, just to put that out there. But they went to Disney World, they had a fantastic time. They got to the front of the lines. Um, and just so we don't run out of time, this is at eight weeks. And then at 10 weeks, we got an x-ray out of the cast. And this is what I was looking at. So now what do you guys think? Yeah, Again, I emphasize this was not a show-off case. <laughs> <laughs> is the child walking on it? He's been walking on it in a spika cast, yeah. So I put him in a single leg spika and he was walking. Did he have any pain when you took him under the cast? He did not have any pain. Well, actually at this point he had a little bit of tenderness um, over the fracture site, but a little bit. And in the spiky cast, no pain at all. And, you know, running around for the family. Is there, is there motion at the fracture site? Like when you, when you're like, do you examine the motion at the fracture site or you can't tell? Not that I was able to tell. Yeah. I mean, it looks like it's, it's trying to become like a hypertrophic non-union. And your question is like, is it your differential? Is it like infected? Um, you know, are there in, increased inflammatory markers? Uh, or, I mean, it's 10 weeks. Does it just need more time because there was a vascular injury? Um, you know, you could consider like a hip, a hip brace or something like that for the kid to walk on so that they're not having to be in a spica and they can still walk. Um, you know, I think you can, I mean, if they're not having pain, you can always wait longer. You know, there's not that much deformity. Right. So nobody would jump in and fix this and, yeah. you know, bone graft it or something like that. No. Yeah. Not yet. Uh, no. Me neither. Um, and all throughout the whole process, inflammatory markers were all normal. So 
as so far as we could tell, no signs of infection. And then this was the most recent x-ray I got. I did not put him in the hip abduction brace. I tortured him with another spike of cast, um, which the family, I mean, you know, in this case, as we discussed, you know, spica is different in terms of its impact on each family. And for this family, you know, in terms of avoiding another um, surgery, because all these subsequent spicas we did in our cast room, not in the OR. Um, so in terms of avoiding an additional um, surgery, the family was all on board with that. This is where we're at now. I mean, I think it looks like it's starting to remodel and heal. It's not complete yet. Any final thoughts on this one? Success. That's better work out. Patience, 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 space. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the lesson that I learned in this. You know, because I was getting a little hesitant and a little nervous. Uh, you know, when I was watching it in the spike, uh, especially when I got that X-ray at ten weeks. Um, but I do think maybe you know the vascular injury led to some dysvascularization to the actual healing potential for the fracture. And it just took longer for an 18 month old for, you know, a fracture not to be completely healed at 16 weeks. I mean, that's a long time. So it's just out of the ordinary for me. Okay. So that's case I one think, for me. So we don't take up too much time. Sandeep, how about you yeah. take it over? Okay. Uh, Taral wants to make a comment while just you... Just a very simple uh, comment, you know. Can you just unshare screen by, by the time? So my comment is that that is what makes fracture femur very interesting to treat in a child. You know, because every in every child, the treatment needs to be tailor-made to the circumstances. There are ages, there are type of fractures, and there are circumstances. And that's what makes it a very, very interesting subject. So do we think... Do we think, because I've heard this multiple times today, that maybe the age-based algorithm is somewhat of a place to start, but it seems like that's phasing out a little bit. And there's a lot more details that we look at to actually make our decisions. Yeah, I agree. And maybe what I need to add to my table now, because that one table I showed where you um, also assess uh, weight and fracture stability is a sh table that I share with the residents. but maybe having a discussion about the social and family situation is something that I should add to that table. Okay. Uh, so can you see my screen, Mike? Yes, Andy. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay. So shall I go ahead with this case before we wind up? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So this was a 12 year old boy who came with a fall, a trivial fall. And this was his x-ray. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we all, since we were on the topic of fracture neck femur, uh, we can see that this is a pathological fracture neck femur. So from, from the faculty, I want uh, opinions on how you would manage this. You have four options, A, curettage and bone graft, B, plating and bone graft, three, intracyst steroid injections, D, elastic nailing. So I, it's open for discussion. What would you like to do? What's his weight? Uh, he's about 45 or 40, 45 kg. And I'm sorry, you might have said this. We know that this is a benign lesion or not? Uh, there, there was no uh, additional imaging in form of MRI or any scans. So I inherited this case after it was treated. I did not have any more imaging other than this. So for me, typically, if it's pretty clear on the x-ray that it's a benign lesion, then I'll take them to the OR and remove some of the tissue from the lesion and send it for a frozen section. And then if the pathologist can tell me that it is a benign lesion, then I would pr proceed with curatage, bone grafting. And then in my hands, I think this would probably be some sort of proximal femoral locking plate. Okay. So yeah, uh, I agree. I agree with that. Team. I I might I might also consider um like some it's just basically something fixed angle like so either a proximal femoral lock and plate or a blade plate I think you you know you could do either one of those and like probably some bone graft uh, okay. cure it out the lesion get the membrane out you know that sort of thing I mean assuming that it's right. gone. Yeah, this is a good one to say you you can't 
here you have to go across the physis. There just isn't enough bone to fix short of the physis, and I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that at all. Okay. So uh, I, I'll go ahead with what was done and how I got the patient. So is that reasonable? No. <laughs> it's funny because I just said that because I think, you know, yeah. you, you hear, you, you just don't have great fixation because um, you're almost in the cyst with your fixation. So I think I understand um, stopping short, the concept of wanting to stop short of the physis. It's, it's actually interesting that most pediatric orthopedic surgeons who actually treat growth issues have no issue with going across the physis here. It's more important yeah. to get the fracture to heal and, and deal, especially in a 12 year old growth yeah. is, is going to be less of an issue. Yeah, because it really made no difference than fixing than pinning a, a skiffy, right? I mean, in a 12 year old who comes in with a skiffy, we have no problems putting a screw into the femoral head and we just tell the family there might be a minimal leg length difference. So this is sort of the same concept. Okay. So, so this was treated. I, I would, I would yeah. say the other thing about this particular implant that you that you probably not want in this is because you have a a, 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 a hollow lesion in there um, and it's a sliding hip screw, you could potentially compress too much. And then it okay. can shorten. So this was treated by an adult orthopedic surgeon about 300 kilometers away from where I practice. And he came to me. Uh, I'll show you the next slide. This was done somewhere else. In three months, he came to me with this picture. So what's happening and what do we now do? Because now he had pain. He couldn't walk. He had a limp and the x-ray is now showing sclerosis of the head with a slip and probably that screws cutting out. So Mike, we've got everything that we wanted in this case, an implant failure, a capital slip and probably a vascular necrosis. And both of us seem to have pointed out that the original surgery was done elsewhere. <laughs> yes. So we are not that is bragging here. We are showing complications of what happens. Probably yeah, you, can also see that the, you can also see that the thing telescope too. I mean, the, um, yes, the, the, the yes. telescope. So, so what do we do now? What are the options? How do we proceed? And if, if you can see, there's, there's a widening of the joint line here. Also, the head is subluxated as compared to the opposite side. Any options? Any any, any suggestions from Eric? Indeed, or... I would rule out infection. You know, it's, uh, yes, in our rule. country, we always have that as an additional bonus. You're right, Taran. So, what do we do? This case, you know, sometimes there may be obvious signs of infection like fever, you know, race count, but sometimes it is not. And the only yeah. way you can sort of prove that is put in a needle under imaging and then, you know, send the so, material, see the material yeah. and send it for culture. No, but uh, there, are, there are three, four things happening here, Taral. Now the implant is failing, there is a slip and the child is in pain. You cannot make out whether the pain is because of implant cutout or infection. Obvious inflammatory markers are not very raised. He doesn't have high fever or CRPs within, say, 10 or 12. Not, not like he's uh, having an abscess or something. I mean, I think I would check, I would check a CT to, to see if the fracture was healed. Okay. You know, if there was a, if, cause I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing if the fracture is healed, I guess is maybe another, if it's not, I mean, it might not change much that you do. I mean, if yeah. it wasn't healed, you'd be more likely to do an osteotomy. Okay. Um, and if it was, if it was healed, then, you know, at CHOP, this, this kid would probably get, you know, revision of his hardware and he'd probably get a vascularized fibula. Okay. Um, because the head is still okay. round. So in theory, yeah, you know, he yeah. does have some so, arthritis there. So you, but you, you could probably get him back with a, a fibula. Exactly. Exactly my thoughts. I thought that this head is still round and I should try to save it in spite of what's happening because it's a benign lesion. So he, this is actually where he presented to me. This was the whole picture. And uh, what I did was I removed the hardware and there was, as Taral said, there was some serous fluid which came out through the tract of the implant and uh, the slip in whatever best position I could, I used a titanium screw 
in view of uh, suspected infection i filled that void with uh, tcp and calcium sulfate and uh, the discharge was sent which grew staff so there was infection and um, i was reasonably happy that i have got a head which i can probably save and uh, he looked reasonably okay but in a couple of days about couple of weeks i would say he was on oral antibiotics and three weeks uh, depending on the staff cultures that i got and when i removed the thomas splint he had severe pain and uh, i revisited the x ray and i saw that actually the head was subluxed even more and the medial joint space looked full in the primary surgery i had not done a capsulotomy i had just removed the implant and reduced the slip in the best possible way and just put a screw there so i had to redo the surgery and there was a collection medially and i drained that and there was again zero sanguinous collection there uh, which was again the same culture staphylococcus aureus and gave we gave an abduction brace and uh, his pain settled down his hip which was subluxed did reduce but uh, eventually uh, another four months went by and the head looked okay to begin with but eventually uh, he had a stiff knee because he was immobilized for such a long time and in enthusiasm we manipulated the knee and he got a supracondylar fracture because of disuse osteopenia so a lot of learning from here that what things can go wrong and what should not be done so manipulating a stiff knee in a child is a really bad idea especially when it's been immobilized you end up getting fractures again that healed up and ultimately the head just dissolved one day and uh, his pain is gone and he is walking around currently with uh, a limp and a waddle but he's got good active slr he's pain free but he limps and this he is now gone to college and is carrying on with something akin to an exigen arthroplasty so why i put up this case was essentially a pathological fracture through a bone cyst uh, today we have options of just stabilizing it closed with elastic nails and it's it's there are numerous papers which have shown that not only does the fracture heal the cyst also consolidates and a really an open curettage and bone grafting a, a high morbidity surgery is uh, uh, questionable whether you really need to do it a closed elastic nailing can just heal the cyst because it's an inflammatory cyst which drains off and stability and bone marrow as it flows in can consolidate it so uh, that that was just a message that i wanted to give through this case so i i guess i'll stop here uh, because we have less time if there are any questions we'll take those and we'll have some closing remarks by mike and min on the case and overall the webinar sandy what's the heaviest child that you've treated with the flexible nails we've treated a lot of kids that are younger and smaller yes. with those successfully but uh, 45 kilos was was a little heavy for me yeah but uh, since this was not a fracture it was just a cyst for a, a fra fracture femur i would use elastic nails up to 40 45 kg but for a cyst since the bone otherwise is intact you can use an elastic nail for breaking the intra uh, lock the the septae and allowing bone marrow to flow in and preventing a path, path fracture and uh, allowing it to heal so i don't think weight criteria holds true when there is no fracture <coughs> Okay. what will be the plan for management uh in in your context you know moving forward for him in this child yeah so that he is now he can squat he can walk he limps but he's pain free and he's not come back for an additional procedure if he had complaints of instability probably i would have considered uh, something like a pelvic support osteotomy uh, with uh, a distal femoral varus lengthening but uh, he's okay with what he's got right now and hasn't come back reported back for treatment he's too young for a hip replacement to the other faculty what uh, what's the youngest for a hip replacement at your institutions 
13, 1-3. Yeah, they will do them in uh, in young patients if needed. So I, you know, yes. I think we've seen teenagers with with hip replacements for bad perthes or AVN or something like that. Yeah, same. Right. This question I wanted to ask you with the previous infection, uh, you know, uh, you know, what would be the precautions and enthusiasm for a hip replacement? How mm -hmm. would you wait? Um, yeah. So I don't think that will be a problem, Taral, because uh, the infection when the child comes for, I mean, he's an adult when he comes for a total hip replacement, technically. So in our institution, if there is an infection, they wait for three months. If there is a window of uh, uh, three months without any signs of infection and the inflammatory markers are normal, and they do an aspiration of the hip joint and take for culture. And if it doesn't grow anything, they go ahead and do uh, totally hip Okay. Yeah. So uh, I guess uh, we are about 15 minutes over time. And uh, I think we can stop. We'll end this uh, webinar today. And I would invite uh, Deeran Bai and Min to make the concluding remarks again. And thank you for attending. Thanks faculty for great talks and everybody who's watching this webinar. Thanks, Mike, for a great collaboration. Thanks, Sandeep. And I completely agree with you. It's been great working with you. We appreciate everyone's time. So thanks to all the faculty that took time out of their morning or evening to join us. Um, and be looking forward to doing this again um, you know, in the springtime. Great. So they didn't find Min, and then I think I guess we'll wind up. Yeah, just uh, uh, Mike, one thing like before spring, we can do one more session because it was really interesting session, and we all learned a lot from the interactions and the cases. So think about uh, doing one more session before spring. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds <laughs> good. Yeah, I would I would uh, add to that. Congratulations to Mike and Sandeep for uh, organization and to all the faculty and participants. I think this was a great example of two-way learning. We certainly learned a lot from your cases um, as well. Um, and then uh, I think this is just a great collaboration. Um, and it's amazing to me uh, how uh, impactful it can be through such a large audience that you have um, with your streaming and, and other media. So um, look forward to many more of these. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Min, for sparing time on a Saturday morning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ashok, thank we can you, everybody. stop the recording. Thanks, everyone. Yes, Happy thank weekend you. to all of you. Yeah. Happy thank weekend. you. Same to you. Thank you. So we'll give you a